properties, which may include commercial assets, renting house, warehousing, hotels, or specific floors also. The introduction of regulation is set to enhance investor trust, broadening the em uh, embrace of the growing asset category. This effort is expected to offer vital back backing of real estate developer, uh, creating an extra opportunity to capitalize an asset and inject essential liquid into the industry. Now, as you are aware that recently SEBI chairperson is also advocate about the investment in RIT and in RIT, uh, and simultaneously uh, they talk about the uh, how to promote these two uh, instrument and two segment. And during the SEBI uh, wide notification dated 8th March 2024 recently has amended the SEBI Real Estate Investment Trust Regulation 2014 to create a regulatory framework for facilitation of small and medium rates with an asset value of 50 crore uh, at least 50 crore and maximum asset value of 500 crore. Uh, as we are aware that RIT is um, a start from 500 crore minimum and he if, here there is a small uh, RIT stops here at 500 crore. So 50 to 500 in the small and 500 ever will go to the RIT. The facilities, investment opportunity in smaller projectees, uh, properties, specific floors or proficient residential project that is covered in this. And if you see this, this is a hybrid of RIT and AIA, the concept of a regulatory framework which they have come out. And they have mentioned also that 95% of a small and medium rate can invest in uh, completed projects. Uh, only 5% they can use for the liquid fund. But if we see the other uh, rate also, that is 80% they can do and 20% they can use for incomplete projects. 10 lakh rupees is the minimum uh, uh, investment value which somebody can give. So today we will all discuss the concept of this RIT, uh, this is a small scale uh, medium RITs. So key issues which we will discuss today, one is the structure of a small medium RITs, migration of existing structure meeting certain specific criteria, obligation of the investment manager including net worth, experience and minimum uh, unit holding uh, requirement, investment conditions, minimum subscription, distribution norms, valuation of assets, and most important that we will discuss about the uh, uh, FOR4, that is a fractional ownership right. So that uh, we will discuss. And for today's program, we have invited uh, our learned speaker. I will just introduce them. Uh, first, Mr. Anurag Sharma is a founding member and head of the investment of acquisition Wise X. Uh, this is Anurag has a established track record in valuation and transaction advisory. He has closely worked on numerous uh, acquisition transaction for institutional clients like BlackRock, Walmart, KPMG, and DLF. And he has worked. Uh, he is working. This this is also a platform for fractional ownership. So we will get. To, to understand the new concept where uh, people which are having a less money and they want to invest, how these people are doing this. So I welcome Anurag for this program. Then we have a double mystery is a vice president investment and partnership of new initiative of Switz. Double is a chartered accountant and MBA from Indian uh, IB, ISP. He has worked with Credit Suisse for six years in the fixed income space and worked for KPMG for three years. He has been working with HBITS with, uh, for the last 15 months. He is looking after all uh, things, growth, and has been a part of HBITS uh, success team, which has uh, doubled their AUM and headcounts. Uh, he worked closely with family offices and other large institutions, helping educate and help investors with their diversified goals. Uh, at HBIT, uh, uh, he looks after investment, partnership, and new business, and he also worked in the founder's office, particularly in his part of core team that is launching their own CAT2 alternative investment fund uh, focusing on commercial real estate. So I welcome Dhawal for uh, today's program. And definitely with the experience and exposure of Anurag and Dhawal, 
our participant will get uh, something new for this concept and they will understand uh, the new opportunity of new uh, segment where they can spread their portfolio and, and they can mitigate the risk. So then we have Ankit Singhi, Head Corporate Affairs and Compliance Corporate Professional. And then we have a Priyanshi Mittal, Associate Corporate and uh, Affairs and Compliance Corporate Professional. Now friends, as you are aware that we are continuously organizing program every week, four to six. And this is our uh, endeavor that we are touching the new topics, new things, and what is new happening in the uh, market. So in the same direction, we are having this program and uh, this journey, which we have done this, it is continuously we will do. And that's why I want to announce uh, that our next webinar, uh, that is 160th webinar is on PIT regulation because now uh, they have included the fiduciary uh, like chartered accountant, auditors, company secretary, consultant in the PIT regulation. And as a fiduciary person, they are now under the obligation of follow the PIT regulation on 19th April. Uh, this announcement I'm doing in the beginning and I will do in the last also. So please join this. And today's program structure is that uh, first Ankit Singhi will speak about the concept of this and then Priyanshi Mittal will cover the entire legal aspects on this and Dhawal Mistri and then Anurag will discuss about the practical aspects and what these people are doing on the fractional ownership uh, concept that they will discuss. They have a platform. They are working on this. So this is another alternative program. And friends, I uh, I was just, just um, surprised to see that this, this particular segment will shortly will grow because both investor side as well as the the investee side both people are interested in this and we can see this is the new concept new instrument and uh, a new avenue for investment less popular but slowly slowly uh, as soon as this type of webinar this type of things will communicate uh, people will definitely do and i will do i was doing the research also so i saw that in united states mature rich market with diverse sector regulatory support from SEC for various investment avenues is there. European market, growth in logistic and residential properties, a strong regulatory framework supporting transparency and liquidity that the UK and German market is doing. Then uh, Asia specific, Singapore and Australia established rate market and robust regulatory environment supporting SME that is also there. In Latin America, Brazil and Mexico, exploring reforms to make it more accessible to smaller investors, focusing on traditionally less accessible real estate market. So this is one concept which will boost the real estate market also. And this will fulfill the requirement of fund, requirement of various other things, which is already missing because for real estate, everybody is not giving uh, money in a traditional route. But now SEBI has made a rules, regulation and strict compliances and RENA is also making uh, the, um, uh, the investor protection in all aspects, combining both the things, the uh, the project side RENA is doing and the investment size, the SEBI is working on this. So this concept will definitely will bloom and grow and uh, investor will also come. And this sector by doing this, will definitely benefit it. So now I will request Ankit to just uh, explain about this concept. And then after that, Priyanshi will cover this. Over to you, Ankit. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you. And, and thanks all the participants. Hope I am very uh, clearly audible. Priyanshi, can you put the slides? So I'll just touch upon the brief uh, brief about the current read uh, framework in India. And uh, then Priyanshi will uh, take that forward. Yes, yeah, it's visible. Uh, yes. yes, it's visible. So yeah. uh, let me move to the first slide. So um, in year 2014, I believe uh, SEBI for the first time introduced the concept of REITs. 
and uh, in some in substance read is basically a framework where there is a um, um, there are various participants in that framework and in some participants uh, creates a reads some participants manages the read and then there are unit holders who invest money and get um, uh, an instrument in form of a unit in case of a company they get shares so in in case of a trust they get units and by way of that units they um, get return on their units in form of the investment that the trust makes in real estate properties uh, basically properties which are uh, gen uh, earning rent or capital appreciation you you cannot have any read with just hold some asset and earn money out of the appreciation they have to be income generating properties and as sir mentioned 80% of them has to be uh, in, in deployed in the income generating properties so read in in that sense is a structure where there is a trust which manages the entire um, uh, which launches the entire read then there are certain other participants which we will discuss there is an also a requirement of every read to be registered in india with sebi and there is also requirement of a mandatory listing uh, with the sebi with the exchanges within a period of 3 years so once you get a registration with sebi you get 3 years plus one additional extension year to get yourself listed on the uh, stock exchanges in india so that is an important thing while in case of other instruments like aifs uh, there is not a mandatory requirement to for you to list this is a important requirement in case of a read that once you create a read register with sebi there you have to mandatorily within that period list in case you are not able to list then you have to dissolve the read and then re refund the uh, money that you have taken from the investors so this is how a structure of a read generally is if there is a read then there is a sponsor who basically sets up the read uh, and there is a trustee which oversees the functions of the read then there are managers who are the who are actual the managers of the read they take all the decisions with respect to the investment how the investment will be managed everything uh, related to the business all decisions are taken by the read uh, and then there is a board in that there is also requirement of appointment of independent directors so that an independent and a pro pro professional board manages the read through the investment manager then in read generally can have uh, in can invest into the uh, pro companies which hold these real assets either it can hold in form of direct investment by way of creating them spvs or most of the reits have created in holdco in between the spvs and they invest in holdco and then holdco invest in all those uh, uh, spvs where the actual real estate uh, is being uh, put uh, and which generates the income in form of rent and capital appreciation and then reverses is back to the uh, reit and then it goes back to the unit holders can you go to this next slide so here we have shown that how it works so investors invest into reit uh, that reit invest the fund in spvs holdco uh, there is a manager who owns the management fees then holdcos are required to distribute um, 90% of their net distributable fund to reit and then reit is also required to distribute simultaneously net of the distri net dis 90% of the distribution of the ndcf to the investor so one important thing is that in case you invest in a company the return is in form of basically a dividend and dividend is also at the discretion of the board uh, whenever they want to declare the dividend but in case of reit um, the concept is called as distribution not dividend and there is a mandatory distribution required so as per law half yearly distribution is mandatory for all the reits and they uh, the law is also clear that how much of the uh, total surplus uh, or what we called as a net distributable computable fund has to be distributed to the investors so whatever the investment is you are sure to get some return out of that investment if you invest through a reit structure which is otherwise in case of a company the in case you invest in a listed entity there are two ways you get through capital appreciation of the value of the shares and other is in form of dividend dividend is not naturally mandatory for a company to declare but capital appreciation you can always expect in case of reit you can get both of them you can get a capital appreciation of your units because they are traded on the exchanges but once they get listed and then you also get a regular flow of income in form of the distributions which they are mandated to do uh, over a period of time existing reits in india there are basically uh, total reits which are registered there are five but out of them five four are listed reits uh, mbc of spark i believe uh, uh, mbc of spark brookfield mindspace these are nexus select trust these are all listed i think ap apart from uh, nexus select trust which is purely into management of malls commercial malls all others are in basically into office spaces as of now they all three managers uh, um, office spaces the area of portfolio number of outstanding units are there and uh, 
I think uh, Embassy Read was the first one to list, uh, post the notification and post the registration. And then thereafter, uh, these lists have also registered. One uh, Read, which is registered in 2022, they have the period of three years. So in times to come, we'll also three, one more out of the current five to be listed on the exchanges. And with the new uh, framework in place, uh, we see a lot many new entrants in this field of uh, SN, SNM Reads. Next. Key characteristics, as I informed you, it invests in residential and commercial high value real estate. 80% has to be invested in uh, income generating properties. Uh, minimum value of assets they need to own is 500 crores. And then the initial issue size that they have to offer to the public uh, once they get listed is 250 crores. Then there are certain eligibility criteria for sponsors, for investment managers, uh, for them to comply if they want to register a, a REIT. Similar uh, framework are also there for SM REIT, but to a lot of extent are diluted in terms of the requirement of net worth and experience in managing real estate uh, properties. Like for investment manager, there is a mandatory requirement of um, uh, experience of managing fund related uh, businesses, real estate related business, advisory related businesses. Similarly for a sponsor, there are a specific requirement of having limit, a specified period of experience of managing real estate, development of real estate. So therefore, um, a sponsor is someone who is already into real estate business. Uh, and then he wants to use the uh, REIT uh, structure to then develop further on those. Investment managers are those which are uh, which are also from the real estate background, have expertise in managing such assets uh, primarily because they don't not necessarily need not to be carrying such businesses in, in past, but managing such businesses, managing such funds, uh, then they can be eligible to uh, act as an investment manager. And then there is an investment trustee. Um, generally, there are registered trustees, which are SEBI approved trustees. Those are appointed as uh, trustees uh, in case of the REIT. And then unit holders are, it can be the initial unit holders, which are sponsors in themselves. And then uh, other uh, unit holders that uh, subscribe the units as part of the IPO process. So that is all with respect to the current read. Uh, this is how a read is structured. Uh, now I'll request uh, Priyanshi uh, to discuss about FOP and how the uh, what are the regulatory framework on the SNM reads. Up to you, Priyanshi. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Thank you, sir, for such a detailed overview on how reads are formed and how they function in India. So coming to FOPs, fractional ownership platforms. So what are FOPs? FOPs are recently trending business models which you know offer joint fractional ownership to uh, the investors to the prospective investors of uh, real estate assets which are residential commercial like buildings office spaces warehouses shopping centers etc so how does this work in layman's language if i explain it so investors pool in their money and uh, the fops on behalf of the investors they identify a property which is uh, attractive and which is like revenue generating. So, and they invest, they pool, they invest that money into that property. The investment size generally ranges from 10 to 25 lakhs with uh, 10 to 20 investors around. And uh, then since, and then they jointly own that property. Since there is joint ownership, so the cost and benefits are also shared. And given the size of the investment per, uh, per investor, 10 to 25 lakhs, the investors are generally high net worth investors. Give, uh, as Ankisar explained that REIT, REITs are required to have asset size of at least 500 CR. So there, the, the, the REIT market is more accessible to institutional investors. But SM, uh, this uh, FOPs, they have kept the initial investment size to 10 to 25 lakhs, which makes it accessible and attractive to high net worth individual investors also. So how these FOPs have evolved? Why, why we are hearing FOPs now? So given in last two, three years, we have seen a huge surge in FOPs because, because of these three reasons majorly. First is the lack of avenues for real estate investment in India. Now, although REITs have been established back in 2014, we have seen only four REITs getting listed till now in the span of 10 years. So still for individual investors, there still remains a lack of avenues for real estate investment in India. 
secondly due to requirement of reits to have an asset size of at least 500 cr which is a very huge uh, amount so they uh, as we discussed they to be accessible to institutional investors now high net worth individual investors are still looking for sir, some uh, better opportunities where they can invest in fops being so and FOBs, FOPs being so accessible to a common man as they are web-based platforms, they are offering their services through web-based platforms. So it is more accessible to uh, institutional investors, individual investors. Also, the small property fund owners, fund managers, they see FOP as a more uh, easy way to uh, invest the funds of the investors as, ex as compared to REITs, given the less compliance requirements, given the less regulations in the market. So still now FOPs have been a very simple uh, method to invest the, in real estate investment as compared to REITs. What is the transaction structure? How they operate? So they, although there is no uh, particular structure or no particular way of FOPs being operating since they are not regulated yet. This is a uh, uh, this is a this is a structure that is that has been sourced from the consultation paper issued by SEBI. So firstly these FOPs since they are web-based platforms, so they identify a property, then they list that property on their website seeking public interest. And the token amount ranges from around 10,000 to 1 lakh rupees. Now, once they float this property on their website and they in, they receive the 100% uh, interest from the public, then they decide to purchase that property. And they follow, since uh, they also operate through a private limited company only, so they follow the uh, compliances related to private placement. So they issue the securities to the investors in the form of, uh, on the basis of private placement. So they float a placement memorandum to, to such investors. Once the amount is received from the investors into their escrow accounts, they issue the securities and the transfer, uh, this ownership, the investors get the joint ownership in that property. Some of the leading uh, and self-disclosed FOPs as per the uh, consultation paper are HBITS, Visex, Strata Prop, Prop Returns and Prop Share. And we are very uh, honored to have speakers from the first two FOPs today. So why uh, SEBI felt the need to regulate such FOPs? Now, since we have seen a surge in such FOPs and more and more investors are now willing to invest in this platform. So SEBI felt the need to regulate due to majorly due to the uh, investor protection to in, uh, protect the rights of the investors. Now, since they are operating in a structure similar to REITs and investing in real estate investment in India, they are not regulated by any particular law. Although we all are aware of the RERA Act, which exists for real estate in India, but the model of uh, the, this business model, this entire business model of FOPs, how they operate is not governed by RERA. And RERA also does not list out the investor uh, protection rights in case any investor faces any grievances with these FOPs. So there are no uh, investor grievance redressal mechanism as such available under the RERA Act. So, Identifying this major concern related to investor right, rights protection, SEBI felt the need to regulate these FOPs. To talk about more, uh, to talk more about these this need for regulating FOPs. So as I already mentioned, there is no specific law for governing them. Now, since there is no law, so there is no particular structure. There are varied structures that these FOPs are following. Like there is no particular structure in which they will operate, and their business model also varies. And due to the lack of any law, there is no uniformity in disclosures also. Some FOPs are not even disclosing uh, their businesses or their practices. Some of the uh, FOPs are self-disclosing, but not every FOP is disclosing. So there is there still remains lack of uniformity in such disclosure standards. Also, since they are not disclosing, so they, we, the investors are not very much aware of the operations or the valuation exercises that they are taking, uh, that they are undertaking. So there is no uh, this transparency in the uh, operations and valuations of such FOPs. There is no specific mechanism for investor redressal as I talked earlier. The, since uh, it's not regulated, so KYC and PMLA guidelines. So now since they uh, garner interest from public and they invest their money into such real estates, but the uh, KYC and P P uh, PMLA guidelines are not being followed. 
and also the major point uh, of regulating these FOPs are since they are very private, they, they are operating in a very private manner and uh, they are operating in a private limited company structure. So as we all know, there are there is a limit of investors in a private limited, which is limited to 200 only. Now, uh, this um, since and there is also a there also remains a restriction on the transfer uh, uh, this transferability right. There is a restriction on uh, transfer of shares in the case of private companies. So whenever this joint owners in a property, they wish if any of the investor suppose suppose they've invested in a property of 100 cr and we have 10 investors now since if one of those investors wishes to uh, exit such fop so they are dependent on such fops to allow them to transfer their shares they they they'll have to identify a prospective buyer they'll have to follow the practice of uh, this the process of transfer of shares so the investors is very much dependent on such fops to allow them to exit from the fop so this is a major concern which SEBI uh, recognized and felt that these FOPs should be regulated. So this is the current structure. Now, as I mentioned, there is no particular structure or there is there are varied uh, business models that these FOPs are following. This is a basic structure uh, which we feel uh, most of the FOPs are currently operating in. So the FOPs are following two models generally. First is that they invest, they are, uh, they are, uh, purchasing the properties and they are investing the funds by way of through through the through uh, SPV. SPV is a private limited company which they create and they pull the invest, uh, in money from the investors. They take the money from the investors and invests in a particular SPV in which the real estate asset is held. Or they also allow the investors to directly uh, uh, own the property and uh, jointly own the property. So this this is these are two ways in which FOPs are currently operating. So now, with the uh, this need that we have established for regulating FOPs, so SEBI has now introduced the SM REITs framework. On May 12th, 2023, last year, we witnessed SEBI issuing a consultation paper on this regulatory mechanism. Earlier, the term coined was micro, small and medium REITs, which has now been changed to SM REITs. So by way of this consultation paper, they proposed that these FOPs should also be regulated and be brought in within the purview of the REIT regulations itself. The reason is because they are already operating in much similar manner as REITs and the business and the uh, basic, uh, this basic idea and basic business is also very similar. So SEBI, uh, finally on this 8th of March, we witnessed that SEBI amended the REIT regulations and included these FOPs uh, and uh, this framework for them. So what are the key parties involved, key parties and key terms involved in SM REITs? Now, to understand SM REITs, we need to understand these terms. So what itself is small and medium REIT, trustee, investment managers, SPV and scheme. So coming to small and medium REIT. So SM REIT has been defined as an uh, entity that will pool money from investors under one or more schemes. Now, this is very interesting uh, factor, which we'll uh, talk about later. So they will pull money from investors and uh, invest in a particular asset. So the asset size prop that has been, uh, that is to be acquired has to be at least 50 CR, but not more than 500 CR since above 5 CR, uh, not less than uh, 500 and less than 500 CR because starting from 500 CR, uh, the compliances with respect to REITs shall have to be complied with. Minimum number of unit holders in a particular scheme which will acquire the assets has to be not less than 200. It, it, will, it will, similar to read, it will also be registered in the form of a trust and registered under the Registration Act. And the main objective of uh, this REIT has to be under, has to undertake, has to be undertaking activity of read through one or more schemes only. Trustee. So similar in the structure of REIT, there has to be a trustee which will be a registered debenture trustee. And it, it its role is to protect the invest interest of the unit holders, to protect the interest of the investors and hold the scheme and the property in trust for them. And the trustee must not be an associate of the investment manager since investment manager is directly involved in, the man in managing the affairs of the SM REIT. Now coming to the investment manager, this is the most uh, important party to the SM REIT as it will undertake the uh, 
undertake this uh, this action of setting up the SM read itself. Then it manages the assets and investments of SM read and undertakes all the operational activities, all the compliance related activities, all the decision making uh, on behalf of SM read. So. In REITs, we have manager, which uh, undertakes the activities, and we have sponsor, which set, sets up the SM REIT. So this is a key fundamental difference between REIT and SM REIT, where uh, this, in case of SM REIT, the requirement of having a sep sponsor as a separate entity has been done away with. So in REITs, we have sponsor and manager, but in SM REITs, we have only the investment manager who will undertake the responsibilities of sponsor as well as the manager. So the net worth criteria that the investment manager is required to meet has to be at least INR 20 CR, uh, out of which 10 crores has to be in the form of positive liquid net worth. Now liquid net worth is uh, the investment in liquid assets, uh, which are un unencumbered. Now experience, so an investment manager should have a minimum of two years of experience in the real estate industry and real estate fund management. Now this is one relaxation that has been provided to investment manager that instead of having two years of experience itself, it can also employ two KMPs who will show, who should have minimum of five years of experience in the real estate industry. So either of the two conditions can be complied with. Activity, so investment manager, since it will be managing the operations of the SM REIT, so it needs to, uh, um, uh, the, the, the sole responsibility of investment manager is to manage the assets and investments and uh, undertake the decision making for SM REIT. And it also needs to ensure that all the rights and uh, this trademarks and all the intellectual property rights are also safeguarded. Board composition is very much similar to existing REITs. At least half of the directors should be independent and they should not be a director of any other uh, investment manager or manager of SM REIT or REIT. Coming to SPV, so SPV has here has been defined as a company, which is uh, this one more point in investment manager. Uh, manager in case of REIT can be a company or an LLP, but in case of SM REIT, it has to be a company only. Coming to SPV, so SPV has been defined as a company, which is a, which has to be a wholly owned subsidiary of the scheme of the REIT. And SPV shall not have any other capital. So what does this imply? In case of REITs, SPV uh, is defined to have uh, at least 50% of interest, 50% uh, of equity ownership from uh, REIT. But here, SPV has been defined as a wholly owned subsidiary company. So, and uh, this, uh, this uh, it has to be a wholly owned subsidiary of the scheme of the REIT. Now, what is scheme? We'll try to understand. Scheme has been defined as a distinct and separate scheme, which is to be launched for uh, this owning of real estate properties through SPVs. So now it's similar to what we uh, what we study in AIFs. So there has this this scheme concept has been introduced in case of SM REITs. So SM REITs are now required whenever they uh, they whenever they plan to buy any property, whenever they plan to invest in any real estate property. So they have to float a scheme. They have to prepare and float a scheme. A scheme will then invest in the SPV. So coming to the uh, structure of what we can understand, uh, from which we can try to understand is, so this SM REITs, whenever they plan to purchase any property, they will float a scheme. They will formulate and float a scheme. So the scheme will then invest in the uh, SPVs and in the uh, real estate properties. So now this uh, scheme for every every time when the scheme can have multiple assets also one one scheme can have multiple assets and but there will be no multiple classes of units that can be issued in a particular scheme. So coming to the highlights of uh, SM REITs, if we just try to summarize what what all uh, highlighted po highlight points have been uh, given in the uh, amendments. So structure of SM REITs has been defined as it shall also be in the form of a trust and registered with SEBI similar to REITs. Parties we have already discussed. So unlike REITs, sponsor is not a separate entity here. Size of the asset, it must be at least 50 CR and must not exceed 500 CR. So this is uh, in, in, in REITs, it's 500. Lending activities, so SM REITs, so this is very interesting. SM REITs are totally prohibited from lending funds to any entity other than their own SPVs. And the SPVs are also further prohibited from lending to any other entity. 
investment size so the minimum investment threshold for sm reits has been established at 10 lakhs uh, investor uh, willing to invest has to invest at least 10 lakhs and uh, price of each unit has also been uh, fixed at 10 lakhs only in conventional reits existing reits it has been established from uh, at 10000 to 15000 and the price to be determined is through book building process now talking about the investment avenues so the SM REITs are obligated to invest at least 95% of the uh, scheme assets in the uh, completed and revenue generating properties. So in existing REITs, it's 80% which they need to uh, invest in completed and revenue generating properties and 20% can be uh, invested in under construction properties. But in case of SM REITs, uh, what we understand is uh, since the interest of smaller investors, not uh, other than non, uh, other than institutional investors is involved in case of SM REITs. So this uh, added, uh, this added, uh, compliance requirements, this added protection has been given to such unit holders. So at least 95% of the value is now to be uh, invested in interest revenue generating active uh, assets. So coming, uh, talking about leverage, so this is a very key highlight feature of SM REITs. SM REITs, now normal REITs can undertake borrowings and uh, lend funds uh, sorry, borrow funds in uh, compliance with the existing REIT regulations. They need to comply with the uh, laid out framework and they can make, uh, make borrowings. But for SM REIT, it's, it, uh, REITs, it has been clearly uh, specified that whenever they will float any scheme of a document, so unless and until they have uh, they have mentioned their in, uh, of their intention to uh, borrow funds in future, if such intention is not clearly mentioned, is not mentioned in the such scheme of a document, then they cannot undertake borrowings. They cannot undertake leverage in future for that particular scheme. So for them to, uh, for enabling them to borrow, they need to include this intention in the scheme of a document. Only then they can make borrowings. Coming to the distribution requirements. So, since there, uh, here also we have the concept of SPVs only and in normal REITs also. So in case of SM REITs, minimum 95% of the net distributable cash flows has to be distributed to the uh, scheme of the SM REIT, particular scheme. And then the scheme will then transfer such amount to the investors. And uh, in, uh, in existing REITs, the requirement is to distribute 90% of the NDCFs by SPV to REIT. Distribution to unit holders, so 100% of NDCF of SM REIT scheme, uh, the, the, the distribution that the SM REIT scheme shall which uh, receive from their SPVs, so 100% of that NDCF has to be distributed to the unit holders of that scheme. In, in existing REITs, the requirement is minimum 90%. So let's talk about other few key conditions. So... The entire existing REIT regulations has been made applicable to SM REITs, except these four chapters. So registration of REITs, issue and listing of units, investment conditions, related party transactions, because they because they have specified a different criteria, because they have specified a different mode of uh, implementation of these, uh, these processes in case of SM REITs. So they have uh, not made these chapters applicable to SM REITs. In SM REIT, SPV has to be a wholly owned subsidiary of the SM REIT scheme, unlike SPV in case of REIT, this we have already discussed. There can be multiple assets in a scheme, but no multiple classes of units in a scheme is allowed. And also there's one requirement, uh, since property title due diligence is very critical in case of real estate investments, since you are pooling money from the investors and investing in a particular real estate asset. So to have proper due diligence of such property titles and to maintain the documents of such property title diligence is very critical. So these documents are to be kept in a safe deposit box at a scheduled commercial bank and this will be annually inspected by the trustee. So let's talk about migration for existing FOPs. So till now we talked about SM REITs, which will be registered and which will be formed and registered in future. But the existing FOPs that are there in the markets, so there a migration requirement has been laid down for, for them. So the existing FOPs may or may not, they may also come up with new SM REITs, but if in case they wish to migrate, so they can apply for migration and registration as an SM REIT uh, with SEBI. 
So a period of six months have been provided to existing FOPs to apply for such migration and registration since the uh, date of notification, which was 8th of March. So they have to apply for migration on or before September 8th. And migration of and then once they uh, once the certificate of registration is granted to them, so from the date of such certificate, they have to complete the process of migration within further six months. Also, very interestingly, existing there is a requirement uh, for uh, SM REITs that will be that will list. So they need to uh, have an asset size of at least fifty CR and minimum investors of two hundred. So this is at the time of listing. This is this is what they have to comply at the time of listing. Not this requirement is not required to be met at the time of migration. So for migration and for getting the registration as an SM REIT, they can uh, uh, this requirement is not applicable at that stage. So what are the benefits of new framework for FO, FOPs? If we talk about the benefits of this new framework. So what I understand, what I believe is since SEBI will be regulating these FOPs now, so there will be much better opportunities as they will be more transparent, as they will be more, uh, more uh, known by the general public. So there will be better opportunities for such FOPs. Also, since they are required to uh, invest 95% of their uh, reven uh, in income in this revenue generating properties, so we can, uh, the investors can expect a stable investment and a stable source of income. Strict eligibility and governance norm will align the interest of investors and FOPs since there will be more transparency. Enhanced liquidity and exit opportunities. So now this is very important point since we talked earlier, which we uh, talked earlier because now, since till now, uh, the investors are dependent on FOPs for uh, facilitating their transfer of shares. Now, so given that this scheme will be listed, so this uh, that this will be uh, lead to increased liquidity, and the investors are free to exit as and when they desire. Increased transparency, of course, and investor protection. Since now, all the investor protection norms laid by SEBI will be applicable to such SM REITs. So this will lead to increased investor protection and redressal of investor grievances can be undertaken in a very, uh, in uh, in the in similar manner as the listed companies. So now with the benefits comes challenges. So there are a few challenges also which we feel uh, will be uh, faced by these FOPs while migrating to such concept of SM rates. First is the engagement of parties since there are certain parties which are mandatory, mandatory to be uh, involved in case of SM REITs like trustee, investment manager. So engagement of such parties will be a challenge. Initially, it will be a challenge. Now, and also since there is requirement of this network criteria and experience which is to be met by the investment manager. So initially meeting those criteria by the investment manager will be a challenge. Prerequisites of net worth and experience that we just talked. Acquiring funds, pre-listing compliances. Now, since the asset size has been laid down, pre-listing compliances will be made applicable uh, as per the listing framework, which will uh, come into picture. So all this uh, issue and subscription size. So now, uh, till now, they were work, uh, they were operating in, uh, in a the limit of 200 uh, investors for a particular SPV. Now, since it will be listed, so the minimum number of unit holders has to be 200. So seeking interest of such huge number of investors may be an initial challenge for them since they are not operating in such kind of uh, business environment till now. And the time frame of six plus six months for registration and migration, we feel it's a very uh, limited time frame and they would definitely require more time for com uh, complying with these requirements since uh, there's a lot to be done, uh, even for registration and migration. So thank you. Uh, that's it from my side. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Priyanshi, uh, for covering this. Uh, you have explained each and everything. Ankit and you have done uh, a wonderful job and this presentation which we have uh, you have shown we will share it to uh, the uh, all the people okay now uh, uh, you have mentioned uh, so many points uh, relating to advantage disadvantage uh, do you think that um, uh, ankit and uh, uh, priyanshi uh, the advantage of this is more because of in increased opportunity for growth flexibility, higher yield potential, less market correlation, regulatory oversight by SEBI because there's a protection, access of international quality investor because institutional investors are allowed. So that's why, and professional management, all these things are there. But do you think that, um, and that you have mentioned, 
but sir definitely uh, i think the uh, benefits would be far more and as sir we have been seen in past any sector which has which becomes regulated sector going forward have always seen a um, lot of development going forward in that area if you see both reeds and invits have come across at same point of time uh, while reeds have still is in developing stage uh, there are number of invits which have registered Similarly, AIF you see um, uh, more than thousand. I think AIF would be registered in India at this point of time, and uh, so going forward, uh, this concept will definitely be going to take a lot of space um, in the coming days. What needs to be done is better clarity. I think IPO is something where um, um, some might find challenge in finding those people uh, to invest. But as and when the f- sector gains popularity, then more awareness will be there, and people will be investing. okay but ankit i think uh, there are some disadvantages of this also like higher risk market exposure and volatility liquidity concern limited capital resources operational management challenges sensitivity to interest rate and regulatory compliance cost i'm not asking uh, answer of this no nee, to to some extent sir uh, um, uh, these are actually good for example if you see the higher investment limit of 10 lakhs is to ensure that um, um uh, individuals only having good um, net worth can enter in this area to begin with even in terms of the uh, scheme there will be schemes which will have leverage which will not have leverage so schemes which don't opt for leverage at the time of their initiation those companies will not have access to that outside debt so then the risk will be limited to that extent so to, i think it's a, a starting stone in that direction and going forward this will definitely undergo a lot of changes specifically with respect to the investment limit i see in times to come this may further go down uh, seeing the success that it may see in times to come okay ankit this seeking interest of the uh, investor on number of 200 that is for the private limited company is it not a cumbersome and hindrance because now so, you are saying 10 lakh rupees is minimum mm. and then 200 it means ki 10 lakh multiply by 200 so how the, that can the, that is there sir some some uh, in uh, i think investors can be at the initial stage when the reits is formed you uh, uh, bring in those properties and then you go for ipo you can have some of them uh, at at the time of ipo so you can juggle with that uh, during that course of time yes but i uh, as i mentioned uh, i think uh, because it's a starting stone so they just want to be little more safe in terms of who they allow to invest in such form of business okay okay and i think we will can better understand from dhawal and anurag i can i can uh, i am posing some question for dhawal and uh, they can cover this mm. in my opinion uh, if this uh, this particular instrument can be have a diversification liquidity improvement should also be there because whenever somebody is investing in the property and something is coming like this it is not equivalent to the share on fd and then uh, access to cheap capital because capital if they will get better capital cheap capital they can because you people are working in this area so you can highlight these points regulatory reforms wherever it require please suggest risk management framework that is uh, uh, also require very robust risk management system and then innovative investment structure because all these structure which are there which is a vanilla uh, do you think that something is required transparency reporting standard is not formal it's not a uniform that is there marketing and investor education that is also one of the biggest challenge that people are not aware i as a person in this area i am also not aware of so many things so many i am not using as a tool of investment uh, because that is a Uh, we think this is a complicated thing so education is required now over to you anurag first uh, you can explain to uh, and some points which i have mentioned you can cover in your and uh, cover your part uh absolutely uh, pavan thank you so much uh, for number one providing this platform and uh, we are glad to be part of this forum uh so yeah i mean uh, you know before i i comment on uh, what issues there could be or you know uh, the quality uh, the quality in the real estate or the or these or the uh, you know products which are there how will that change uh, i would number one want to wish uh, 
you know best to say be that you know they are very keen in improving the investment quality in the indian uh, context they want to protect the retail investors which is which is superb to see uh, however what we what i basically feel is that uh, you know uh, since the managers uh, in this case are also a very key stakeholder of this whole equation uh i was expecting a slight more slightly more uh, inclination of protecting their interest as well uh if let's say both the parties have their interest protected then probably it it is a win win for both the entities and both the ends of the equation uh for example in this case the reason we started this business we were trying to solve the three main problems number one is that the people who do not have access to 10 crores 20 crores which is basically required to enter a commercial uh, real estate investment uh you know they they would end up settle with the, let's say a residential uh, flat or a small shop which would yield them nothing but 1 and 1/2 2% maximum the second problem was that uh, you know they wouldn't really get a manager to manage that show uh, these retail investors don't really have the time to ensure that everything is being taken care of uh, so they they wanted a manager or someone to look after this however with the investment amount that they could afford which is let's say under 50 lakh rupees uh, no one would sign up uh, for a manager duty there the third problem was uh, that within this under 50 lakh rupees within uh, the problem of having a manager can the products be safe or not and within the safety i feel there are two uh, further uh, channels number one is the regulatory framework is that there or not and second is the quality of the product which comes in uh, quality is again a subjective uh, topic so i'll cover that a little later but uh, so what we are planning on doing is that let's let's bring together these retail investors with 10 lakh rupees or 20 or 25 lakh rupees gather a large pool of money to be able to purchase a commercial real estate which we could do the second problem is manager so now obviously a 25 lakh investor wouldn't be really be able to afford a a, a manager but then a 80 crore or a 100 crore rupee asset can afford to have a manager in itself and hence with that uh, total quantum of money uh, we could offer our services to those investors so that way we could solve the second problem the third problem was that uh, you know the quality uh, of or the safety of the asset that we were offering there comes our experience there comes the real estate background that i or let's say the other uh, fob fob platforms which are there they might hold or they might employ people to ensure that the product that we are putting on our platform is safe for the uh, investors to uh, put in uh, there was one thing which was lacking which is the optimum regulatory framework i wouldn't really agree to the fact that it was it was totally unregulated which i think was mentioned in, in part of your presentation because it was regulated but in a different model which was the uh, registrar of companies until now which ideally wasn't in the best uh, you know spirit of the law that i totally agree with uh, but it it wasn't uh, really illegal uh, so yeah i mean with with that roc coming in with that uh, companies act coming in the structure was more or less there so this way i mean all these three problems were solved the reason that we were into this business was we were making money at the same time our investors were making money we had the provision of performance fee we had the provision of making management fee etc however that what we feel is is not completely been taken care of when we are looking at uh, uh, the framework which has recently been drafted uh, something will will you know or might uh, compromise be in this case which is basically number one sebi is ensured that you can't go below 10 lakh rupees so i mean one thing is is locked second is the manager eligibility criteria is quite there so that is solved third is there is a proper and very robust structure sebi has put in so that problem is also solved the one aspect which is left is the subjectivity on the quality of the asset that uh, would be brought in in front of the investors now we or i'm i believe all the platforms which are functioning right now will always ensure that the assets are uh, at par with the quality and uh, you know provide uh, optimum risk and reward scenario to the investors but then with with no other margin of making money for the platform it becomes very difficult to take care of all the aspects so we are still awaiting some clarification from sebi as to how would the managers fee be structured uh and uh, you know with that uh, the second question that i had that since there is 100% of the uh, ncdf which is to be distributed with the shareholders 
if tomorrow there is there is a requirement of putting in fund back into the uh, REIT or the SPVs, from where are we sourcing that money? Because ultimately the funds are the SPV or the manager are really not left with any money. Uh, how would that be uh, you know taken care of? For example, the marketing uh, aspect that you mentioned about that the managers have to take care of the marketing aspect, appointment of the merchant bankers. There are various costs that will come in to a regulated product, per to say. So, so for that, I mean, these are some gray areas where we are looking, we are still awaiting clarity from SEBI. And also we are innovating daily to how can we serve SEBI and also the shareholders and at the end can make money for ourselves as well. So that is an evolving uh, process that I think we are already into. And the good part is that that process has started finally. Uh, so with that, I mean, I can only say that uh, I'm personally very glad to have that to have this uh, robust structure in place. And uh, exciting times ahead is what I feel. Anurag, can you explain uh, that what you are doing? Because uh, you, as a professional, we have understood when this program which we are doing, it is a both way. Yeah. Create. So just uh, tell me what you people are doing. Uh, so, uh, Pavan, right now, if 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 you were to ask me, I mean, we are in the process of uh, evaluating how this needs to be taken care of. Obviously, as uh, you know, Priyanshi uh, rightly mentioned that we have about six months to come down to a plan and structure of taking this forward. We are currently in the process of uh, deploying or choosing our merchant bankers or investment managers who can sort of uh, help us out. Uh, at the same time, we are also we've submitted some queries to SEBI where we are expecting their responses as to what are the process and the what steps to be taken care uh, while getting ourselves registered. Uh, probably in about a month's time, we'll have some clarity on how are we planning to take this forward. Okay, okay. So uh, now, uh, Dhawal, uh, your turn. <clears throat> yeah. So you have first... to add on this. No, no, thanks. Anu, Anurag was detailed and uh, excellent at this. But thanks, uh, guys, for like giving us the platform and letting us speak our mind. Um, just I just wanted to add a few things, or maybe I would just like to backtrack a few things on how this whole space evolved. You know, we've been knocking on Sebi's doors for two years, literally saying, you know, the space is something which is there in the West. Why can't we have this space created in India? There are unicorns in the West which have done this, and. Uh, Eventually, obviously, things fructified. We are now where we stand. And we think this is literally a watershed moment for us and for the industry in general. Um, India has $1.2 trillion of wealth and almost 50 to 60% of it lies in real estate. So it's it's a no-brainer that this asset class needs to in, uh, evolve. People need to start thinking a little uh, better. And SEBI rightfully has to take care of its small and retail investors to just uh, so so you know this 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 SM REIT pretty much checks every box there is you know because you know you hear all these news you know you have the zero das everyone saying everyone is trading ninety percent of the traders lose money people are just taking riskier bets this product is just tailor made for people a not to lose their money earn a stable standard income routine income on a monthly basis and everything with sebi's regulatory stamp makes everything kosher so just just uh, just just highlighting the fact that mrs madhi puri bach the sebi chief she has been i don't i think she's been the best person at marketing and advocating this product off late she's expecting i mean in her speech you guys may have heard that this 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 segment could get the same influence mutual fund industry in the next 10 years so it is uh, it is absolutely no doubt that this uh, space requires a lot of attention. Uh, there are players like Vizax, HBits, and and so many more, four five that are doing this. Uh, it requires a lot of uh, detailed understanding of the space experience. It's not an easy space. We we work with you know for every asset that we acquire, we work with like the best tier one law firms. We work with international property consultants. We kind of bulletproof every transaction for the investors. And we make this, in, in, in our sense, as good as a risk-free transactions. So I, 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 I'm very, very, very happy. Of course, there are a few gray areas. If every regulation comes gray areas, which, which, which I am confident that SEBI being so responsive and receptive will, will sort it out. 
and uh, yeah i mean this points anurag race continue to stand like we 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 await a little bit more clarity on the fees especially on the fees actually so but double what uh, what would force existing fops to even convert for example and the in current form when you give your return to the investors in what form do they invest equity in your company and then it is being given as form of a dividend now how these fops currently work all right so just i'll just uh, i'll just give you an example so hmm. every s every asset let's say i buy fifth floor of a particular building so what i'll do is i'll freshly float an spv or a special which is a private limited company this private limited company will house this asset and all my investors will be owners of this spv they will h bits will not be playing with money or no fop player plays with the money everything is routed through an escrow which goes straight into the spv this spv issues equity shares and compulsory convertible debentures ccd basically mimics the uh, rental income and equity share is basically used for the capital appreciation or basically to take when you sell the uh, shares uh, when you sell your uh, spv the ccd is convert to equity shares so right now fop players don't mingle with the money and that's how it should be rightfully and uh, so that's how it works currently just in the newer structure we have another added layer of a scheme and the scheme will be that the, there will be units which will be issued every asset will be like um, an ipo structure for every asset and uh, as we speak we are in the process of identifying merchant bankers everyone is in the same boat are doing the same thing okay okay so uh, uh, just tell me that you both have platform so how the investor can come and how they can uh, do trading and how they can in, invest uh, in sm uh, this uh, uh, fop sure uh, dhawan would you want to go first no 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 go for it i'll just put up my Super. Uh, so, uh, Pawan, what happens currently is that uh, uh, there there are properties which are available uh, with the FOPs uh, which are functioning right now, where the properties are completely leased out and are delivering somewhere between uh, let's say nine uh, percent plus returns to their investors. Uh, obviously, post uh, the fee deduction of the platform, the net that goes out to the investors, uh, you know, somewhere lies between. uh 8 to 8 and a half uh, percent uh with this what happens is that the the way that the, to answer your question that the way that the investors can get in touch is basically simply log into our uh, website uh which can be circulated post this webinar uh, through you uh and then they can uh, simply log in uh, do their kyc and there's a button called uh, schedule a call with the, your investment manager the manager will run the investors through the whole process uh which includes the details of the property the details uh, of the price which are there in the micro market the property at which the property oh, sorry the price at which the property is scheduled to be purchased the taxation uh also uh another part is we are also you know educating all our investors about the upcoming sm reit regardless of uh, what they are looking into uh and hence uh, this 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 is how we take it forward uh at the beginning of the investment we are taking only 5% as the token and then eventually uh once the whole opportunity is subscribed uh the balance money is requested from the shareholders once that money is in uh the rental income starts to accrue for the shareholders in the proportion of their shareholding from the next very day okay okay and uh, what about uh, you dhawal no just exactly what anurag said it's uh, it's fairly simple it's fairly straightforward for a new person who wants to do an investment he can literally do it within minutes uh everything is online everything is tech enabled uh it's also obviously we have people dedicated people who speak to uh, our investors educate them um in, frankly we spend most of our time educating customers the investments is they they they, uh, they themselves invest on their own we don't really go and pitch it because it's it, it's an asset class which is really light right it's it's, it's a darling sector it's 60% of our income does lie in this asset class so it's all about just educating them and giving them a hassle free ownership of a top a grade building which is tenanted by a triple a tenant which is i mean never existed in india before this so, okay so so tenant is compulsory income is compulsory uh, coming income is compulsory yes yes so 
even as per the SM REIT, it has to be a pre-lease property, or they say 95% has to be rent generating, which mean, which essentially means the same thing. And uh, it has to be pre-leased. And uh, what we try to do is we work in the top six, seven cities, work only on grade A assets. That, that's somewhere we deep dive into because we how, want to give something which is the best for our investors. How you give the grade? How you give the grade? There are multiple scenarios you need to see, right? The micro market analysis, the building quality, the, you know, is it close to highway, uh, ATMs, et cetera, et cetera. Is it gold lead certified? So you have lots of parameters that basically give grades and uh, that that's what we focus at. Okay. Suppose I have a property of 60 crore and rented. Okay. Now I'm coming to you and I'm asking that, can you raise fund for this? What, how you will do this? Uh, sure. So, Pavan, since I have a, a acquisition background, I'll probably keep the finance questions to Dhawal and the real uh, the the construction or the acquisition questions to myself. Uh, so, what we essentially do is that uh, we, we number one, our first priority check for you know picking up asset is the retransactability of the property, which is either can the property be retenantable in case the tenant moves out, or can the property be sold. Uh, at the price or beyond the price that we've bought it. Uh, so number one, as Dhawal mentioned, that there are certain parameters which every uh, you know investor nowadays is is aware of. For example, the the type of tenant which is there uh, is the building. Uh, you know, the, does the building have any uh, rating from either IGBC or LEED? Uh, and uh, where does the the building falls under? What is the occupancy level in the building? Uh, it shouldn't be the case that, you know, the, the one floor that we are buying is only tenanted out and the rest of the building is empty. Uh, also, uh, does the building uh, has all the required checks uh, or not in place? We also spend quite a hefty amount of money on the legal DD, uh, given that it will be distributed with all the investors and the property should be safe regardless of what money it, it uh, at the end generates. You know, 1% here or there doesn't really matter for the investors. The safety of the asset matters uh, at most. Okay. Uh, apart from that, uh, you know, as I said, the income certainty matters the most to these investors, uh, whether it is the in rental income or the capital gains or the, cap you know, capital appreciation. So we do uh, go much deeper into that uh, establishing the certainty of the cash flows, that what is the lease period? What are the lock-in periods? How good is the tenant? It shouldn't be the case that, you know, a building has a, a lease for 10 years, let's say a lock-in for 10 years, but it's a startup, which might shut down tomorrow. Uh, and, you know, regardless of the lock-in, uh, the certainty is not there. So we do believe in investing or picking up buildings, which number one are good uh, in terms of quality and uh, house good tenants. Okay. Okay. So now I have received so many questions. So what I'll do, I'll finish these questions, then I'll come back certain other things okay now my first question so the questions is like this i will ask question anyone can raise hand so i will ask and somebody want to supplement something you can uh, uh, just raise. so i will ask so first question is whether non-resident can function as trustee and manager of the writ i, do, I don't think so trustee there are have to be registered trust with sebi okay any other buddy has a different view okay we are running an LLP where I am a partner. I want to transfer my shares to my daughter. Can I transfer my shares to them? Sir, it's not, I think, relevant. Okay, this is not connected to this today's topic. Mm. But, uh, you can transfer, but uh, you can uh, discuss separately. For less than 50 crore, what will be the governing law? Private limited still or any other? I understand the small medium rate is for more than 50 crore. I think the current FOP's model which they are operating um, can work for such a set because minimum requirement is 50 crores. Okay. Okay. Can you elaborate more on this trust? On, on the trustee? Ankit? So uh, it, it has to be a CB registered uh, trustee. There, there are trustee regulations. There are companies uh, like Access uh, Trustees, Catis. There are a lot of registered trustees. Those who are registered with SEBI as a trustee can act as a trustee for such kind of a read. Okay. 
Ankit, what would be the organization structure of uh, small uh, medium rates, the sponsor, trustee, and the investment manager? Please explain. I think as Priyanshi mentioned, in case of small medium rates, investment manager and sponsor needs to be one. And then there is a trustee um, who is having similar functions, which is in case of a REITs. Okay. The only difference is that there can be one. Even in case of REITs also, now there is also a concept which have been introduced last year, where over a period of time, the investment manager can also act as a sponsor. Uh, but for uh, an SMD, it has to be from day one. Okay. Uh, can you, uh, uh, somebody ask, what is the full form of FOP. So this is fractional ownership platform. Any other person wants to add anything else? Okay. Simple as that. What do you mean by minimum number of investor would be 200 if it is a private limited company, as you said? Ranshi. Yeah, I think, sir, this is the point you made. You were comparing uh, 200 private companies. Wala na. So, okay. So uh, let me answer that. Yeah. So basically, right now, as per Section 2 of Companies Act, you can't have more than 200 members in a private limited company. So I think that's that's the answer to why the 200 number came from. However, in SM REITs, this is no more existent because uh, the private limited company will be held by the scheme and uh, we need to have uh, unit holders which have to be at least 200. Because the scheme will be listed. It has to get yes. listed. So the minimum number has been set to 200. So if I but, multiply by uh, 10 lakh to 200, it is only 20 crore. Hmm. Yes, we have investors who put in higher denomination. We can have three hundred and fifty yeah. investors, so it opens up. Okay, yeah. but uh, Dhawal and Anurag, do you find this requirement challenging going forward? No, we do not. I mean, in that case, uh, obviously, uh, we so the number of investors that we have or uh, have had in the past uh, are always under two hundred. And in case we are buying properties where uh, the the overall tickets or overall asset size is beyond uh, uh, you know a certain certain parameter where uh, we need more than two hundred investors, we uh, pick those that asset up in two different SPVs so okay. that we can go as high as four hundred investors. Okay. Uh, can any penalties uh, discuss on taxation of uh, SM rate as well as? The panelists uh, discuss on taxation. Any taxation issue in this? Uh, if you have come across, double in. Uh... So this will be taxed on the same way that normal REITs are taxed. The three-year holding, uh, after which it's LTCG of ten percent, below which uh, it's fifteen percent. Um, the rental income, which will be paid to the investors, will be taxed at individual slab rate. So these are the two forms of income. Okay. Uh, do FOP with less than 50 crore as asset size need to be compulsorily be registered with this, uh, with, with uh, small and rate? No compulsion. No compulsion. Okay. What I think even even in the regulation itself, there's an explanation that existing companies which are operating in such structure, uh, where they are managing companies and there are shareholders, they are not necessarily be, to be, raised, uh, be treated as a in form of an SM REIT. Okay. What yield and IRR would potentially uh, uh, this rate would plan will offer? Double and unrun. Sure. So uh, in this one, I mean, as, as I said, we are yet to uh, have clarities on the type of fees that we can charge, the manner the fees can be charged, or the fees cannot be charged accordingly, the yields, uh, you know, will change. Uh, for one thing that I'm sure that appointing these uh, merchant bankers will cost somewhere around six to seven percent of the asset, which will further be, uh, you know, a hefty expense on the pocket of the investment manager. So all of that needs to be blended in the opportunity cost of blocking 20 crore rupees has to be blended in. There are various things which need to be taken care of. Obviously, since SEBI is coming in now, the risk is going down. So the investor can possibility can possibly or may uh, you know settle with the slightly lower yield uh, which could be a, you know i'm not sure how how low than what it is currently but uh, i feel it it would be slightly lower than what it is being floated uh, with the fops and okay. I, I think uh, and then there is also an added advantage of uh, appreciation in terms of unit value which right. which which is otherwise because it's a tradable unit i think that would also create some kind of return 
Absolutely. Okay. Now, whether legal due diligence reports shall be made a compulsory part of the effort document or not in order to bring more investor protection? So, uh, this, uh, for this, the formats will be prescribed and uh, it will be similar to what uh, has been prescribed for REITs only. So, it's a very comprehensive document. It, 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 it pertains, it includes a lot of details. So, I believe legal due diligence will also be a key aspect of the offer document. And nothing okay. really changes because we this has already been happening. Mm. It just continues as is. So, I mean, yeah, so th th this is status quo for all practical purposes. And I think that any merchant banker will definitely not be floating an offer document. And this is normal, until, normal. Uh, he uh, has the diligence report okay. with him. Okay. Uh, at what cap, uh, cap rates these transactions will take place? Any idea, Dhawan, which yeah. you have generally seen it's 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 there's no blanket cap rate in the country but uh it depends which city which micro market you're in so, Anurag, Karachi, and also Pahang. at the also at the you know uh the uh, the events that have taken place in the asset for example if the tenant is not there uh or let's say the lock-in is or the lease tenure is nearing completion or the building is slightly older or the desirability will always be a factor of the property to a new buyer and that will command the cap rate uh, in, in the market. Tentatively, we've seen that it's it's always been somewhere around uh, 7 to 8, 8.5%. Okay. Whether we can buy additional property after receiving money from public? No, this will be floated for a particular asset. Okay. So, I mean, it has to be structured. It has to go towards that. Achha, in your opinion, what like you have mentioned, seven and a half percent or eight percent. So why investor will come? What is the interest? Because they can put money in the mutual fund, they can put money in some other um, uh, debt fund. Why they will come to you? And what are the advantages uh, today or tomorrow? Sure. So I mean, uh, Baban, it's the same explanation as uh, why would someone put money spread across mid cap, small cap, large caps? Uh, I mean, we would always expect investors or the educated investors to spread, uh, you know, their uh, capital across various asset classes which are available and are regulated and are safe to invest. And okay. this would function like one. Uh, so I mean, at the same time, the rentals are coming in, the property is being appreciated. Uh, annually, uh, the IRR uh, would be, would be very competitive. Uh, you know, to to a, I would say a large cap, uh, you know, mutual fund. So that way, uh, I think the investor would be keen enough to invest. Okay. And to add to Anurag's point, uh, customers always want to diversify because you don't want to be a part. You don't want to be all all your eggs should not be in one basket. So it's, 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 it's natural for people to hedge their risk. This is a pure <laughs> fixed income because it's backed by uh, rental agreements. And IRRs are, as he, uh, Anurag mentioned, they're in a competitive range from 13 to 16%. So it, it, it makes a great case for people who want to purely diversify their portfolio and not be affected by the volatility. Okay, okay. So, uh, in your opinion, volatility is very uh, less in this uh, segment? It's pure. So, all the money that an investor makes is on the back of the rental agreement. So, there is no uh, other, there's no other dependency. But do you have a response? Say, Suppose the tenant is leaving. Uh, in India, we are listening that this company is closing their business. This company is going out or some other person. So, you have a, that uh, vacant period also. So it is. So I'll, I'll just comment on this. So that is exactly why we ensure, and I'm not saying that only we do. Every other fraction ownership platform ensures the, the retransactability, which takes into account the releaseability of the property, and the rentals that at which we are buying the property. It should be competitive. It shouldn't be the case that the rentals are going on at hundred rupees and our tenant is paying two hundred. So we should go for it. It becomes very difficult for us to retransact that or re release that property once that this tenant goes down. So those those are the factors which will protect and which I'm sure, uh, you know, investors are already now educated about. Uh, they have the right questions to be asked. So that's that's what makes uh, all this ecosystem very interesting. Okay. Do existing FOP have to compulsorily be converted in a small medium rate within six months, uh, Priyanshi? So, so as mentioned, it's optional for them. They can either migrate to the SMB, uh, they can either migrate their existing FOP to SMB, or they can also come up with a new SMB and register that. 
Okay, but they can't run uh, uh, the, the existing SOP like this. No, I, I don't think that there is any uh, restrictions on anything like that. No, no. What is the then? It what is, is the correct answer? Do existing FOP have to compulsorily be converted in SM, or they, they can continue? They cannot continue as FOPs if they are uh, in uh, dealing with the asset size of at least fifty CR. If they if they are dealing with such assets, they have to uh, uh, get into the structure of SM. Okay, so any migration is optional. Migration is optional. They can either migrate or they can come up with new SM rate. Okay, so it means I have a forty crore rupees FOP. I can continue. Yes. Okay. Can we have S, uh, uh, this uh, small medium rate in farmland? No, sir. The sense okay. it has to be an income generating uh, set, holding just a land. With no, 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 farmland. Uh, suppose farmland. There's a production is going on, and then you are producing wheat, rice, or so many things, vegetable. And it's there's not a... an income generating. I'm, I'm not sure. No, so I'll, I'll comment on that. So yeah, it's no. really mentioned in the regulation that it has to be, you know, fully constructed. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can't do speculation of land or let's say land is yielding rental. So we can't really put uh, that uh, under the SM rate scheme. Okay. Okay. What should be the return? Ideally from such an asset would be four to four, five percent per annum be okay. Bank let out properties are being sold and bought at that rate. So, what is your view? Uh, uh, I mean, and... To answer this, this is exactly where FOP and our expertise come in. We don't buy four to four point five percent because then technically you're making lesser money than a fixed deposit. Also, so we we, we typically look for anywhere uh, seven and a half and upwards range, um, and a four four and a half. Of course, it exists, but that's not the our focus area or our, the properties we get into. Okay. There can be private REIT as well as all REITs can be private? So, so private REIT, I think that concept is with invits. That concept is not for REITs. Yeah. Okay. Whether we need a specifically mentioned amount of rent which investor will receive or percentage of distribution is mentioned in the offer document will suffice. Sir, uh, percentage of distribution is, is a legal mandate provided under the regulation itself. Uh, I don't think uh, exact amount of rent one can mention. Um, I think some estimation would be there, double on in the offer document as to what kind of rent one can may expect. Absolutely. It will be a full disclosure. It's mentioned in the document, mm -hmm. the gazette that we've received that uh, the offer document needs to have uh, the overall returns that an investor should expect, the rental, the area, the purchase price, etc. Any windfall in this uh, type of uh, rental uh, things? which you have seen any windfall? I mean, it's a, it's a very, uh, you know, broad uh, asset class. So there are obviously uh, cases where there have been uh, tenants who've violated uh, the lock-ins due to their bankruptcy cases or, you know, XYZ legalities come into play. But then again, that is why the retail investors need asset managers or investment managers to sort of uh, keep them uh, safe from such a case. Okay. Is less than 50 crore size FOP remain unregulated? Yes. It, I think they will continue to function in the current uh, uh, style which they're operating. But how the investor protection will take place? In the similar manner in which I think people like Anurag and Dawal are giving to them the investor production. So the one in, uh, in uh, uh, Anurag, how you are protecting um, uh, less than fifty crore? Sure. Please. So uh, okay, go uh, for it. Yeah, yeah. So I'll just uh, use. I'll just give out one sentence and then pass it on to Dhawal. Uh, that since there is a, a rigorous valuation exercise done prior to picking up the asset, there are very limited or very negligible chances of principal erosion. Even if let's say tomorrow uh, the rental income stops. Uh, we do believe that we'll be able to exit the property, uh, you know, with limited capital appreciation, if not, uh, you know, very high. Yeah. What do you think? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Will... And as as said that at any given point of time, the asset belongs to the investor, so they own that asset, and the va value of asset can't be eroded; it can't become zero. So at all points, investors are protected by a hard asset, which is in their name. So it it. Uh, the, the unregulated part, it may sound little negative, but it goes on as we speak and it is 
it, it's going on very smoothly so in, a, in in sir in a well, just in a standard case double how many members are there in one set of company for example a one fop structure you create how many members are generally there so i'll just give you h bit so our average is 160 to 175 people are there uh, are so there. then managing all them so it is easy to say ki invest uh, asset is with the company but then when something happens managing all those 170 people i think there where you where you play your role precisely so uh, coming to this investor protection point i just want to know how do you provide the exit opportunity to your existing uh, investors has there been any instance where any investor has wished to exit from your uh, respective you know, that investment yes it's very normal if someone wants to say let's say there's an emergency at someone's house and someone wants urgent need of funds we've been able to facilitate this entire exit uh, for these investors uh, to give you some number from hwits perspective 2.1% of our au uh, investors have asked for an exit of our au and everyone has been facilitated an exit we run so our own internal be... loyalty pro, pro, programs through which we run it it takes us approximately 10 to 15 working days okay so you have already pre identified buyers or how does that work not only do we uh, so we have our own loyalty program i will like go to my existing investors i have my wait listed investors i go to my other investors etc so we, we have a lot of people and there are people who are just waiting like hawks who want to invest in a property hmm. which was previously entered into okay sometime you have a property and government has taken over because of metro because of some reason like you have seen east of kalash east of kalash railway station metro station is in the uh, from it's a part of the house which they have taken over so i'll i'll take that up uh, pavan uh, uh, what happens is that even if the government picks up or acquires any part of the private property usually the the as per the rera uh, uh, rule book any property which is acquired by the government within the urban limits gives uh, them a charge of about 2x of the uh, market price and in case the property is in rural limit it it gives them about four times uh, of the money that they okay. get from the government okay so so this is also a windfall which i was asking uh, okay now if an investment manager is not able to buy property identified and mentioned in the offer document then then they can buy any other property no then you have to be uh, very yes. clear on this okay you mentioned you have seen in the past that there is no issue of people to create funds for sm the small medium rate of at least 50 crore this is new concept and how many as rates uh, currently uh, got fl floated can you please name these of few so we already named a few of the leading fops currently uh, now to know their exact uh, asset size currently that that we need to check but i think all of them are operating on a larger scale i don't think uh, i think they are already operating on uh, asset size of more than 50 crore okay yes. and everyone will look to migrate towards sm reit because that's yes. the regulated forum okay. what is the tds implication on rental income same uh, which is session x aspect will remain same only correct okay what is the valuation requirement of the properties under uh, this uh, small medium reit so uh, yeah. half year uh, this annual valuation has been prescribed for sm reits unlike existing reits for which there are there is half yearly valuation and annual valuation so as per sebi requirements they'll have to conduct a annual valuation of all the schemes so valuation any specific concept ankit any specific uh, point you have to seen by the valuer i don't think so sir there is no any specific uh, okay. theme so dawal and anurag any specific instruction for the valuation nothing i mean uh, the valuer needs to adhere to the uh, you know the uh, either the rics uh, model of valuation or basically needs to take into account uh, various models of valuation for example a sales comp where a property is being compared to a, a different property or a different sale transaction happening in the same micro market uh or let's say if it's a rental and generating property they need to come down to a, a, a you know income approach and create a dcf model where it derives the value of the property at what price can the property be traded in the market 
uh, and then there are norms of uh, you know uh, government norms of valuation where we sort of adhere to those by appointing a government uh, uh, valuer and okay. also uh, you know one of the international property consultants as well ankit the uh, registered valuer is allowed to do this prachi yes yes registered valuer is allowed to do this. Okay, and how many time uh, once you have taken a valuation? Then every sir, year. Sir, every year, every year you have to take. You have to so appoint the valuer for a particular period, and then the appointment also. And I think appointment is also approved by the unit holders. Yes. Okay. And it's annual valuation, and as and when you identify a property, and as and when you uh, proceed for acquisition, then also you have to conduct a valuation. And the legal due diligence is required for how many times? So that is part of once when the offer document is there. Otherwise, there is no such mandate of carrying any legal diligence. Otherwise, okay, okay. Is it a distribution to any other tax pay in the hands? No, I think it is taxable similarly as a dividend. Correct. Yes. <clears throat> okay. What is the view of uh, this written FOP on residential properties since quality of tenant is probably from commercial side because there is a difference between. a uh, commercial site is a higher valuation and this is less the business aspect i think anurag dhawal can say but i think we have seen as reits are, which are there mostly are on commercial properties only yeah so primarily because i mean the commercial properties offer longer tenancy agreements uh, usually and also the rent since the property is being picked up by companies who are running businesses out of that uh, space they are okay paying a higher rental to what a resident might pay on the residential flat so at the end of the day it it is the yield that an investor makes so since the yields are uh, as a rule of thumb lower on residential side usually fops prefer commercial properties okay can properties with 23 lakh per annum rental income be positioned as 55 crore rent with grade triple a tenant profile which is around 5% current yield not including 5% rent increment increment yearly and uh, rent increment uh, 5% yearly and possible capital appreciation so is it i don't i haven't checked the math but if 5% is the yield then uh, the odds of it qualifying as an asset for any any of the platforms would be fairly low but okay. yes since it crosses 50 crores yes it could possibly uh, be accelerated so they are asking opinion of uh, both uh, i mean it, it meets the eligibility criteria but uh, would someone like to pick it up uh, that's debatable and what if the tenant fails to pay re rental or is bankrupt if for example if a tenant has a lock in due uh, which uh, puts them legally bound to pay the unutilized lock in rental to be paid to the landlord in case they file for bankruptcy uh, the lock in liability is not there uh, and removed however the the security deposit that they've paid to the landlord at the beginning uh, can be forfeited okay 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 and then property. again be utilized to be distributed to the shareholders okay property price appreciation is still linked to the market volatility so we can't consider this to be a non volatile investment instrument but i think that volatility is not that much that is a capital market in other places correct but and this the there may be volatility and the rental yields are fixed right okay it's on the back of a rent okay agreement is this seminar recorded sorry i missed the start yes you can go to youtube channel of us and you can see or you can go to our website also and on the webinar page you click it and then you can listen and go to the youtube is uh, was uh, rit different uh, i am not using small and medium you just understand that is i'm using so is the rit difference from scheme mentioned in priyanshi slide No, no. So, RIT is a fundamental uh, entity under which these schemes are hosted. Uh, that RIT creates these scheme, and then there is an investment manager that manages the scheme. Okay. So, anyone create multiple FOP of less than fifty crore is allowed. Yes, uh, similar to the existing. So, one uh, the 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 same group is making five SOP, which is less than fifty crore. There so is no is such a regulation uh, in this respect as of now. So you can do it. Uh, do, so this yes, is, people are doing it currently. 
So this is the lacuna which uh, ultimately it, it's a risky profile now. In place of making a more than fifty crore, you are dividing into two, two and three and. Sir, anything which you do to circumvent the law, okay, will always be subject to uh, suspicion and other things. Okay, when I am wants to buy uh, additional property, they need to come out with a new scheme under a writ. It's up to the REIT to launch a scheme, and the investment managers will decide as and when they want to bring a new scheme. And then, if there is a property available where they see their potential of income and then generating something from the unit holders, they will create a new scheme and then float it for the investors who will pull in money and then they will acquire the asset. The scheme okay. can remain the same, however, the SPV needs to be fresh. Yes. Okay. Is there a limit to how many sponsors can be there in the first? So the concept of sponsor is has been done away with in case of SM REITs, and investment manager will be one. Okay. Timeline of distribution to investors, Andhra uh, Dhawan. So this, as per the regulations, it says it has to be at least once every quarter. Yeah. And but the product thesis is being that we distribute it monthly, and that's been a standout feature of this product. So this is one advantage which you can market it when people are coming that. If you are um, uh, come, uh, if you are doing something, you have to sell here. You will get dividend every month. That's, sir, that's uh, yeah, and, and even if you see, sir, uh, like REITs which are listed, for example, Embassy, who's also our client, they they do a quarterly distribution. So I'm just saying. While they are mandated to do a half yearly distribution, but they themselves do a quarterly distribution. So you get a fair share of income every quarter, and then there are other REITs uh, who do some do on half yearly basis too. So in so case of REITs, you definitely have this option of getting a, a flow of income at least half yearly, fixed okay. income. So so it means that th those who want to regular income, this is one of the good instrument where you can uh, take advantage of. Absolutely true. This is for you know people who want regular flow, retired people love a regular income. You know the I mean it it really helps basically with the cash flow management. So when we talk about seven and a half eight percent rental yields. If you if you apply time value of money concept, it actually is eight point two five or a seven point seven five. Yeah, that's because, right. Yes, because so, so, after twelve months you are getting something and you are getting every month. It has a multiplier effect. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, for uh, HVIT, uh, when do you uh, consult when do I no, when do I convert to convert CCD equity? to equity shares? Yeah, so that is done at the time of. It's so not just HVIT; it's for all other FOPs also. They convert CCD to equity shares at the time of exit. Okay. When we look to exit the property as a whole. And even, in, term, even in terms of this uh, return appreciation, I was just seeing the like, for example, one for client Nexus that got listed last year at 100 and currently that is at 133. So you already have an appreciation on the, in terms of the unit value and then the distribution you are getting on the top of it. So, so it's for, a, first time similarly for MSC. First time we are getting an anonymous attendee. So, yes, I know that. <laughs> but he's asking the maximum question. <laughs> no issues. <laughs> Why do FOC prefer office space instead of industrial facility? Any particular legal or yield issue? Uh, so I'll I'll uh, try and address that query. Usually what happens is that number one, uh, there are FOPs who are picking up uh, industrial spaces. The reason that, uh, you know, some of them might not have that as their priority one is because the yields are relatively higher, but the uh, potential for capital appreciation is limited given the land use is restricted. A commercial land use may have a different, uh, you know, asset classes uh, which can be built over it. Uh, but an industrial land can only uh, be used to a limited uh, uses of land. And also when a tenant moves out of the property, uh, you know, the construction on a, on an industrial, uh, plot or industrial property is basically not a concrete construction. I mean, half of the construction is a teen shed or a different mode of, uh, you know, development of a property, which usually erodes with the, with age faster than as compared to a commercial property. So there is involvement of capital infusion, uh, after a, a quick amount of time, quicker amount of time as compared to commercial real estate. Okay, is IPO mandatory for uh, RIT or they can get fund from buy a private placement also? IPO is mandatory. mandatory. Every oh. scheme. So how many IPOs has come, Ankit? Sir, four are listed. Uh, the Embassy. Embassy, Brookfield, uh, Nexus and, and uh, Hindspace. Mindspace. Okay, when you people are planning for IPO? 
they mentioned i think they are in discussions with their merchant bankers yeah. okay to structure can you things. suggest some book on rig covering formation management and compliance if book is not available what is the source of the learn these contact ankit singh he will tell no, no, no. i i have not come across any book i once upon i called my book uh, to send a book on read see send book on reads W R I T. No, no, no. They they are asking. There's no book available. So where should I resource? So I'm saying, uh, you you can listen this webinar. There is a lot of resource also available on that. Because we have received more than forty four questions, hmm. and uh, I think um, regulations is also uh, it's a very well drafted regulations. So you can also get good hands of information as to how things move there. Okay, so this is how will five to fifteen percent sponsor threshold be met by already raised uh, fractions. so i'll take that for existing yeah double please for existing ones they don't need to compulsorily adhere to the 5 to 15% skin in the game uh sponsor money okay qualification and criteria for im it is same or some specialized criteria specified for the rate i am investment huh? manager Quality investment system. manager yes there there are there are conditions on net worth uh, there are conditions yeah. on the experience of the uh, investment manager the office bearers so there are conditions which have been outlined okay now uh, dhawal and uh, anurag how do you anticipate the inclusion of this rate will impact the broader real estate market in india sure so uh, you know pavan we believe that uh, the only thing which was missing in this whole equation was uh, enhancement of confidence uh, for the investors which i think will be taken care of now given that sebi is backing uh, this whole ecosystem uh, which is which is which was primarily uh, slightly gray earlier uh, now that sebi is in a lot of partners would like to work with us a lot of investors uh who have lower appetite of risk taking will sort of come ahead and would want to be part of this uh, whole environment uh, and we believe that you know this this uh, asset class will multiply closer to 10x 20x in the next 3 to 4 years to come okay okay yeah. and just so, to add uh you know right now so among only 10% of grade a office spaces are with reits 90% still stand to be Reeded, be it SM reeds or be it through reeds, and even the amount of absorption, the absorption meaning, I think the amount of office space that is being picked up in the in the whole commercial real estate space is at its all time high. So there is a lot of traction. Uh, if you all have read the news that uh, GCC, which means Global Capability Centers, are yes. all setting put in India. So just a recent report by uh, Novama which says that. Uh, Right now, there is 150 million square foot of uh, GCC occupying, which is poised to become almost 230 million in the next four years. So you know there is a lot of demand. Bank of America has bought over two million, uh, has leased out over two million square foot in the last one year by itself. So there's a lot of traction. Commercial real estate is India provides the best uh, platform for. you know you have the smart individuals you have in engineers you have english speaking people so we kind of check a lot of boxes and uh, india growth story i don't think i need to teach anyone on the india growth story so it's yeah. very surprising that japan came out in 2000 this rit uh, concept and in and uk in 2007 why india is uh, woke up very late what is the reason and mm-hmm. the, the if you have seen 2008 uh, when the um, uh, recession has come uh and that time also in india because of the cash market is there or some other reason why indian market was not uh, taking uh, this concept so to speak india has always been uh we are not the first movers for m- multiple things to be fair uh india has always followed uh, the west uh, when it comes to this REIT is a very mature market in the US, albeit it's a little bit massacred because the prices have gone down considerably. Um, why it took India time is a question. Um, I mean, I, I think it's a very broad level question, not for. Uh, I mean, not within my skill set to answer 
Anurag, if you have something and, to uh, add. Uh, the lens that I look at it is that finally, uh, SEBI uh, felt the need to uh, launch something like this. Uh, they are now more inclined towards protection of the investors' interest, uh, along with the, you know, reinforcing infrastructure of the country uh, on other aspects as well. So I don't really look at that. We've arrived a little late. I look at it from a point that out of all the 200 plus countries which are there, I mean, we feel, uh, uh, you know, we are amongst the top five countries uh, who, who have that infrastructure. Okay. 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 What future development can we expect in the regulatory framework of RIT and how might these changes influence the growth of uh, these uh, REITs? Yeah, I think you might see some racialization going forward in terms of the investment limits. Uh, I think the size may also increase. I think the REITs may, they might increase the size and then give some leeway to SM REITs to perform uh, within that space. Infrastructure. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, some more questions and more the anonymous attendees flooded uh, with the questions now. Would industrial property with 10 years lease and 6-7 years lock-in be attractive properties in the SME rate? Anurag and Dhaval. Oh, sorry, I missed the question. Would industrial industrial properties with 10 years lease and 6-7 and seven years lock-in be attractive opportunity? In Absolutely. Rate? If If traded at a market price, why not? So I think uh, 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 the anonymous attendee can contact you. The company which is another business can become investment manager for it. I don't think there's a No, I don't think so. No, you can't? Sir, generally they are they are regulated head of business. They are Their job is only to advise. They cannot have multiple interests. Okay. What are the, some of the hotspot locations in India for FOPs and RITs? The FOPs can function from, you know, a tier three or tier four city also, but the properties that they're investing into have to be uh, in hotspot locations as uh, uh, yes. in, okay. uh, in terms of uh, the traction that we've seen, not just with our platform, with all the other platforms and the investor strengths that the reports that we go through, uh, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Mumbai, Pune, uh, for that matter, uh, you know, have been on top. In terms of occupancy, in terms of uh, lower, uh, you know, risk or um, the tenants which are there, these these are the cities which uh, perform better. Now that uh, you know, Gurugram has come up with super infrastructure. Noida is another hotspot city which is coming up. <clears throat> Why has no one uh, looked at the vacation rent rental hotel market or fractional ownership yet? There are, there are platforms, platforms that are doing this. Yeah. I came across a few platforms which uh, are uh, dealing in with holiday homes and such vacation properties. Okay. And then you need to factor in uh, the vacancy rates. Uh, probably that right. is why these are uh, you know less known to the investors and are available for people who have uh, wider risk of appetite of risk. Uh, okay. So, yeah. Anurag, a lead for you. Anurag, is your company open to make itself available in Ahmedabad for sales and distribution? Some absolutely, more? absolutely. We do have a network there uh, already. But in case you want to, uh, you know, be in touch, uh, available and uh, happy to get in touch. You can give it, you can give, send it to us. We will pass it to Anurag. <clears throat> sure. Okay. Now, last questions, few last questions. How does India approach to regulating a small and medium-sized rate compared to the small, similar framework in other countries? So I think this SM REITs concept is not very much popular in internationally as of now. We are, and in India also, we are yet to see how this will perform. So it's very early to compare both of those. Okay. So friends, uh, we have replied 53 questions and uh, all answers very nicely by all my four panelists. So it's it. Now uh, we are about to uh, reach about to close this session. Uh, I have a question for Anurag if I can ask. Yeah, yeah you can. Please. So Anurag, as you mentioned earlier, that uh, whenever you feel that there can be more in, uh, investors more than in a particular SPV, so you shift them to another uh, company. Correct. So did you ever like think of any having, uh, opting for any other kind of uh, investment vehicle like collective investment scheme? No, so usually what happens is that if let's say I have uh, one SPV where the investors, uh, you know, are deployed and then I offer a different 
SPV or a different type of SPV for the same property, there might be some conflict of interest. So what we usually do is that this is a vanilla route of uh, getting investors to invest I'm into uh, fractional ownership, which is I'm private. Uh, and that's what we've uh, you know been using. We've not yet ev uh, evaluated different models. Yes, we did start with the uh, LLP in the beginning. Uh, but then, uh, you know, due to efficiency on the taxation side, we switched uh, to private limited. Okay. Okay. So friends, uh, we are doing continuous poll also uh, during the session and we were asking questions. So I will request uh, uh, that this was the first question. Do you believe that the introduction of uh, red will lead to increased investment in real estate market? Uh, 37% say yes and 48% say probably yes. So this uh, majority people are saying not sure, not probably, definitely no is very less. So this is one answer. Next. Uh, Ashwam, next. Hello? Hello? Sir, I think it is it's, it's, the question is changed. The question is changed. It's numbered one, but question is changed. Okay. How I would think... you rate the introduction of concept of uh, rate to the SEBI regulation? So this is uh, rating wise. Uh, I think average rate is 4.18. So that is a high rating. Uh, that is there. Next question. What is the opinion of the new minimum investment requirement of rate? Very affordable, 24%. Somewhat affordable, 41. Neutral, 28. So 10 lakh rupees. Uh, I think this is for this segment, people are more more or less, they are uh, a majority in this favor. Okay, so these were the some questions. So now uh, we have to close the session. So as usual, we are asking the last questions from all four panelists that what is the future of this? Uh, so in, in 30 seconds or 40 seconds, you can just say. I think yeah, uh, I will start with you. Sure. Uh, so I believe, uh, I mean, the future is very, very bright to what we've seen. Obviously, we are going upwards. Uh, the direction is very, very uh, positive. Our investors were asking and our partners that are, that are working with us were always seeking as Dhawal started that, you know, they were looking for a regulatory framework, which finally has arrived. Uh, and that will probably show us results in the next three to four or five years to come in. Also, I believe that uh, there were there were many players, uh, you know, in the space. Now the quality will the quality will basically be there, uh, and the investors can can sort of have have a complaint box to go to, which is SEBI. So that's much much better. Okay, so uh, Dhaval. And yeah, just to conclude, it's just our mass uh, emerging affluent affluent and HNIs have never really invested in this kind of fixed income monthly generating product. So, so for them, this is, and I think it's a, going to be a game changer. It's going to be an eye catcher. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, I only see the, I mean, sky is the limit, frankly, because the, the addressable market of commercial real estate is in a few lakh crores. So, I mean, th th there is umpteen opportunity for every, all, all of us as players, no one person will be able to capture it all either. So there is a uh, lots of scope. It's lots of quality, as he says, and uh, yes, it's just uh, we are in the right direction, at least when it comes to investments in this country. Okay, uh, Priyanshi. So I think it will be a very uh, hit concept, just like REITs, because when REITs were introduced back in two thousand fourteen, so at that time also investors were a bit. Uh, restrictive and they were not very willing to invest uh, through REITs but now it has become a very popular concept in India with uh, as we have witnessed all four REITs are performing really well so I think similar to that SM REITs will also be a very popular concept in coming years okay Ankit sir I think I, I echo with Dhawal uh, uh, real estate is something where everybody is very cautious of burning their fingers and if we can see credible managers, people who can give you their kind of trust to invest money, 
actually you are investing in the manager rather than the estate property property is always there but it's the manager that gives you that confidence that your money is safe but we if don't we, know the manager no we will as part of the process as, as you offer document they will have detailed background in terms of who are there and if sebi is registered them then they be sebi must have always looked into in terms of their credentials they would definitely not be getting some one who has a history of being a defaulter and then start i reads business and being a an investment manager so that kind of confidence that regulations will definitely bring in and uh, um, and i think uh, more and more fops which were there or which were planning to come they would definitely be seeking this route um, to adopt and it will uh, we also need to see how it will pan out with aifs because on similar lines these there is a it's a very unique concept in reeds that you can have schemes because the current reed which is there conventional reed you cannot have scheme you have to have reed which invest in set of properties and you generate income but then now you have multiple schemes that you can float then it brings in in, in par with aif so we have to see regulatory arbitrage that is available in among both the instruments okay thank you thank you ankit thank you dhawal thank you anurag and priyanshi we have covered very you have covered very nicely all the questions you have given answer and the concept of uh, the small and medium rates is very clear and the um, uh, fractional ownership is also very clear and how to convert every point is answered and various multiple question has come which is there so this was a very unique program and i thank all participants also they have participated in ask various questions so thank you very much and friends a uh, special thanks to anurag and uh, dhawal because they have taken out time and come uh, came for this program and we will trouble them again after uh, a few uh, after one after next month or day after because this program is required another series of discussion so thank you very much friends this journey of knowledge sharing will continue and as you are aware that our next webinar on 19th uh, april that is a 160th webinar we will have on pit regulation uh, and mr ali from sebi asgar ali he is the chief general manager he will be there and we are inviting various professionals merchant banker and consultant because this is on the fiduciary duties of people because insider trading laws applicable to the companies insider but now they are extending to the fiduciary relationship uh the concept of uh, sebi has started so under this gamut everybody will come so we will have this program and this program is applicable to all professional anybody who is working with the listed company or connected to the listed company in whatever way they are so join us at 4 o'clock next friday same time 4 o'clock till then